Welcome back, everybody, to Happy Planet, where we speak with entrepreneurs, investors, and thought leaders driving the impact economy. I'm your host, Abigail Carroll. Today, we welcome Tori Enger, CEO of Tico 2030, a Norwegian public company on the forefront of the green hydrogen revolution. Tori is putting mission first, so much so that he even integrated the deadline for the UN sustainability goals into his company's name. Tico 2030 creates fuel cell stacks, which are essentially motors that can be powered by green hydrogen. The company has major strategic partners, grantors, and investors from all around the globe who are helping him put this cutting edge technology into practice as early as this year. I'd like to give some context here. Hydrogen is a known energy source and green hydrogen is a clean form of hydrogen that is made by breaking up water, H2O, into the H and the O, the hydrogen and the oxygen, through a process called electrolysis that is powered by a renewable source. Fuel cell stacks, i.e. the motors that we're discussing here, reverse that process. They put the hydrogen and the oxygen back together to create water and in doing so they generate energy. The only byproduct of green hydrogen is actually water. Green hydrogen is often compared with batteries. They could have many of the same applications, powering cars, trucks, boats, and planes. Many have dismissed green hydrogen, however, as being too far off, too expensive, and too hard to transport. But Tori says, despite these challenges, green hydrogen is at a tipping point, and he's helping to create the momentum. Note that I talked with Tori at the end of 2022, so when he's referencing next year, he's actually talking about 2023. Let's go to the interview. You're the first public company that we've had on this podcast. Wow, that's exciting. <laughs> it's so much news is coming out of your company right now, and your stock has doubled in six weeks. It is very exciting. Yes, of course, we have had a lot of very nice deal flows lately. And this is, of course, things we have been working on for a long, long time. And then suddenly a lot of things is coming along at the same time. We highly appreciate that. And we have a great team of people who has been working many, many hours on all the different things we are working on. It's pretty amazing. So I'm really interested in, you've got sort of three product lines, but I'm really interested in this sort of green hydrogen work you're doing. What I think is very important to know, Abigail, is that we are not a hydrogen producer. Yeah. What we are doing we are creating tomorrow's engine where hydrogen is the fuel. Right. Because you can't just put hydrogen in a classic engine and expect it to work. No. You're making a huge bet on this sort of green hydrogen model and that green hydrogen is going to have a role in this maritime space. Why have you gone in this direction? Why are you betting on this? We have actually been very active on the environmental side of the maritime industry since 2008. And we have been following the trends. We have been following the big waves, what is coming next. And for sure, hydrogen will enter the market in huge amount in 24, 25, and then increase. But it could also be methanol. It could also be ammonia. But all this is driven by hydrogen. And green hydrogen is the only, only pathway to zero emission. Everything else has some emission. Green hydrogen has warm air and water. That's all. No pollution. Zero. So why are there so many naysayers about green hydrogen? Because we hear it all the time. People are like, it's all solar. Or Why are people naysaying it when it seems so obvious that this is going to be part of the solution? If you look into the power of EU, if you look into what the Biden administration is doing now, if you look into Japan, into Korea, Portugal, France, Germany, it happens all over. The train has left the station. It's all about hydrogen. This is the green shift. For those who don't believe in it, fine, but they're going to fail. Interesting. So now you've started with the maritime industry. How is that a great place to start? Because that is our home space. We have been in the marine industry since 1994. We know all our clients. The remaining part of the TECO group is having offices spread all over the world from Houston in West to Singapore in East. And we know all our clients. 
you don't have to penetrate the market because they are already existing clients. So we have been discussing this with, of course, many, many ship owners and industry players. You know, shipping is counting for almost 3% of the greenhouse gases. And as an example, if the maritime industry doesn't do anything and everybody else is, the maritime industry will end in the range of 15 to 18% or greenhouse gases, wow. which will never take place. So yeah. all this is controlled by local government and, of course, IMO, International Maritime Organization, which is a part of the United Nations. So this is driven by international and local rules and regulations. Yeah. Let's take, for example, the Norwegian Heritage Fjords. From January 2026, you are not allowed to go in there unless you can move on zero emission by law. Wow. And this is something you're going to see many places in the world. Let's say that the biggest port in the world is saying that you are not allowed to come in there anymore if you cannot come in on a zero emission. Then you need equipment so you can do the last hour and you can stay the day when you are discharging and charging cargo and you can leave again the first hour on zero emission equipment. If they can do that, it helps the world fantastic. What are the other options? You know, if you're not going to go to hydrogen, what are the other options? You can go battery, of course. But the point is that what about the grid? Right. Everybody's talking about the battery. Nobody's talking about where can we actually get electricity to recharge these batteries. Right. You can do it in Oslo. No problems. We are in the front line. But in the U.S., for example, all over the world, it's not an easy task. Right. And the battery is so heavy that it adds a huge amount of weight to the boat. Battery is very heavy. But of course, you can do a lot of biofuels. There's many things you can do to make the world a better place. We have just taken it all the way to zero emission. But that is green hydrogen and PEM fuel cells. As soon as you start to use an ammonia cracker or a methanol cracker, you are much better than today, but you are not zero emission. Yeah. But I'm not saying that you have to be zero emission. You just have to do your part of the job to make the place a better stay for generations to come. Can we back up a little bit and kind of get into how do the mechanics of green hydrogen work? You're creating an engine, but there's a green hydrogen fuel that's coming into that engine. What are the basic mechanics behind it? We see that for the first seagoing project coming up, which will arrive in 24 and 25, you will see a sort of container-based hydrogen fueling, where you have hydrogen containers inside a bigger container, and you are basically swapping containers wherever you can. And you just get the new one, which is filled up with hydrogen, and you leave the empty one. So it's just to be a cycling on that. And of course, we also think that what we can see that the first mover of hydrogen is basically short sea shipping. For example, Rotterdam to Oslo, over to UK, a pool like that. And of course, you have hundreds of those pools in the world. And then you will for sure see ferry stretches, the long ones, not the short one because they can use battery, but the long ones. That will be the first movers. And then, of course, you're going to see some container ships, which is again into the short sea shipping segment. But we think that you very soon will see big ships having equipment so they can operate on less emission, the last hour in, stay the day, and the last hour out again, because that's helping a lot. But the long distance, they will still go on normal fuel. And you know, according to American Bureau of Shipping, ABS, in 2050, still 40% will be fossil fuels. Wow. So for those green freaks, nerds, which thinks that this is just to switch from black to green, no. This is going yeah. to take 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Yeah. But somebody have to be a part of starting all this. It's a really long haul. And what I'm sort of amazed at is it feels like maybe we're at a little bit of a tipping point, or at least you are. It feels like this is actually coming on pretty quickly. You know, what's the time frame looking like for you? It sounds like you're going to have some ships moving with your technology next year. 
I think that the first you're going to see physically, it's a high truck, a huge truck that you're going to see already next summer. Yeah. Are we all going to be driving hydrogen cars? Do you see this applying to our every days or is that going to stay bigger industrial? 13 to 15 years from today, yes. I would say that from 2030 and onwards, I think you're going to see a lot of passenger cars on hydrogen. BMW has already started. Toyota has started. Hyundai has started. Many things have started. Just one thing. Keep in mind that the passenger cars is not the critical one to move to hydrogen tomorrow. Yeah. Because what they are releasing of emission is peanuts compared to the big things. The industrial, right. The trucks. In the US, you have 16 million trucks. In Europe, you have 6 million. 22 million trucks, which definitely should do something. And why do we think that green hydrogen is going to be the solution and not batteries and EVs? First of all, on trucks, I think that you will very soon see that these guys is already switching to hydrogen because the battery is too heavy. On a 40 ton truck, on a 40 ton truck, the battery is six ton, which means that you're losing six ton of cargo. And a fuel cell would be most likely something like one ton. Yeah. And where are all these trucks going to pick up the grid? Where can they load? Where can they charge? Right. And the time of charging. Because so hydrogen, it's going to work just like fuel. It will be a liquid form. That depends. In Oslo, we have 500 hydrogen driven cars. And they are just going to two hydrogen stations, which is next to the gasoline station. And they basically fill the same way as you fill gasoline. Wow. And the price, people talk about the price of green hydrogen, it's too expensive, but I imagine technology can solve that, right? Economy of scale. It's all about economy of scale. I know that now people are saying that hydrogen is costing from 4 to 11 and it should be down to 1.5. So let's see. It will take some years. In the meantime, government have to, to be a part of supporting the gap, which they just have to. That's amazing. So there are already cars running around Oslo that are hydrogen run. 500. 500. And who's who made those cars? Toyota, for example. T- Toyota also has an EV out. Or did they skip EV and they just went to hydrogen? Oh, they have EV too. Yeah. It seems like we're, we're betting on a bunch of technologies and we'll see what kind of wins the consumer's hearts at the end. I think what the industry is saying is that whatever runs on gasoline today can run on battery right. tomorrow. Whatever runs yeah. on diesel today or more heavy fuel, you have to go to hydrogen. Interesting. And in last part of the third quarter, you will see a huge construction site with a hydrogen container and a fuel cell container operating a construction site on zero emission. Yeah. And then end of next year, beginning of 24, you will most likely see the first floating units from us taking delivery of fuel cells. That's amazing. Next year, we just have a small prototype production and we are moving into full scale production in the beginning of 24. That's amazing. It looks like you just announced a grant, European Union grant to do a demo with a big shipping facility. We have been given 5 million euro in grants from Horizon Europe. And the partner in that project is Shell. And they are also putting the same amount of money into the whole project. And then we are going to retrofit a 18,000 deadweight tonner from a Swedish shipping company called Ektank. And this ship is built in 2018. And it's a normal ship, cannot do much about the, the emission. But with our equipment, she can then suddenly move around in the Baltic operating on a zero emission basis. So this is very good. That's amazing. And it seems to me that this retrofitting is a really important part of your plan, right? The retrofitting will be the name of the game for the next five, six, seven years before this will be on board and you build right away. But when we say retrofit, we have many projects now where we have new ships coming out with a diesel electric engine built in the Middle East and the Far East and then coming to Europe and we will retrofit with hydrogen means that they can operate on both hydrogen and diesel. 
that seems like a game-changing technology so that they can use the ships different ways, different ports have different accesses. How is the hydrogen fuel going to be distributed to these different ports? Are all these ports going to have hydrogen available? I think that, you know, what you see in the oil market today, how all kinds of products are being distributed around the world from production site here to production site there to refineries, blending and so on and moved on forward. In about 10, 15 years, you will see that hydrogen is going to be operated as exactly the same, except that there will be different places where the production takes place. So for example, Norway is luckily still on the map. And of course, because we have a lot of wind. So wherever you have plenty of wind or sun, you have a good base to start to produce green hydrogen. So yeah. Western part of South America is going to be a huge uh, supplier of hydrogen. Australia, the same part of Northern Africa, Middle East and places where you have a lot of wind. So who are the big players in producing hydrogen right now? The green hydrogen? That's not many because it hasn't actually started yet. Right, right. It's, it's now coming slowly, slowly. For example, in Saudi Arabia, in the new town they are talking about called Neum, they have just ordered the biggest electrolyzer in the world to produce green hydrogen. That's interesting. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, if you Google something called Neum, it's N-E-O-M. That is a, a new part of Saudi, which is going to be green. It's going to be international. It's not going to be any Sharia law, and it's going to be zero emission. And this is a big project. And you know, when the Saudis do things, they're doing big. Right. I think they have been putting aside something like 4% now of the total oil income to support green projects. And the other day it was announced that a electrolyzer company in the U.S. has sold a 35 megawatt electrolyzers to a project in the U.S. Canada for producing green hydrogen close to Niagara Falls. Very interesting. After a short break, we'll talk about Tico's strategic partners and vision for the future. We'll also learn about some surprising players in the green hydrogen space. A big thanks to the Maine Technology Institute, MTI, investing in innovation for a prosperous Maine. MTI is Maine's unique public-private partnership whose core mission is to diversify and grow Maine's economy by accelerating innovation in the state's targeted technology sectors. MTI offers grants, loans, equity investments, and services to support Maine entrepreneurs and organizations as they transform their innovative ideas into new products, services, and companies leading to the creation of quality jobs for Maine people. For more information about MTI and its programs, please visit maintechnology.org. For a blue economy to thrive, people need to use more sustainable products. But which products? And will consumers actually adopt them? Innovators like you are hustling to figure this out. Spark number nine can tell you if there's demand for your product. Spark markets your product before it's built using online advertising so you launch smarter. Have a big idea? Vet it with Spark before you build. Visit Spark online at www.sparkno9.com or find them on LinkedIn. Welcome back to Happy Planet. Not all green hydrogen is the same either, right? There's different levels of green in the green hydrogen space. Green is green. Green is green. I like that. Okay. But then you have blue and you have a lot of colors. So where are we getting it from? Right. Green hydrogen is basically sun and wind and water. So I saw that Sun Hydrogen, which is a stock that I've been following for quite a while now, did a big investment in in you and they've got someone on your board now. What is that relationship? I've been talking to Tim for at least two hours today already. (laughs) And I think they are coming from their part of the value chain. And let's see where it all takes us. But when technology, which belongs to Sun Hydrogen, is up and, and doing big scale production, is going to be a fantastic product. They are turning sun straight into hydrogen. Maybe they could be a hydrogen supplier to various ports around the world or big industry places where we have a lot of sun. 
and things like that. When they are ready, it's going to be fantastic. And I think together, these guys are working in the US environment. We are working in the European. We have a lot of things to learn from each other. And we are looking forward to a long and good relations with hydrogen in the years, decades to come. I love that you're a Norwegian company. Obviously, there's this, you know, you've a long history in Norway of the shipping industry, but you're also an economy that has been buoyed by fossil fuels. So how is it that you've made this shift to green hydrogen and, you know, a lot of other sort of green technologies in a country that has had this history of fossil fuels? First of all, I cannot say that Norway is in the forefront of the green hydrogen, but we can be a huge player because we have a nice location. It's very windy in Norway. And of course, we have a lot of gas, so we can produce not green hydrogen, but hydrogen. Yeah. But the main reason why what we're going to produce in Norway, that's because it's not so very labor intensive. And Norwegian are quite good on high tech. And we are quite efficient. We was fitting the business model into a huge AVL computer to see where in the world we could actually put up the production. And of course, when we was putting all this info into the computer, we was dreaming about that Norway should come out as one of the answers to where we could do this. And when the computer said Norway, we were saying hooray. That's wonderful. Now we have established the factory up in the northern part, so we are on the right side of the electrical prices, and I think we are we are we are okay. <laughs> so, this is going to come to market in beginning of twenty twenty four. How long is it going to take for this stuff to really scale, and for it to become part of our daily lexicon? You know, we are producing the engine. We are aiming for having a production of four hundred megawatt. In, in 2025 and 1.6 gigawatt in 2030. That is what we are lining up now production-wise. If the demand is coming even faster, we can ramp up faster. And we have facilities so we can ramp up to produce up there. I think we are not far away from five gigawatt. Yep. And you just announced a production partnership with Tyson Krupps, was that right? Tyson Group is going to deliver all the production equipment, which Tyson Group is doing all over the world. They have more than 100,000 people employed. They have like 35 billion euro in turnover, and they are German, and they are quality without compromise. Not the cheapest, but absolutely the best of the best. So since we are working with other people's money, we have to avoid as much risk as possible, and then you have to go for the best. Speaking of money, are you going to be fundraising? Do you need to raise more money? Or are you going to rely on the stock for that? How do you finance this future? We have already raised, including grants, not far away from 60 million euro. So on the financial side, we're good. So when we're going to do the next round, I don't know. We have no stress at all. Well, the stock certainly seems very happy about what's been going on. <laughs> very nice. We really love to deliver results to the shareholders. Yeah, well, I got to get on that one. <laughs> so tell me, you know, you've been in the maritime industry. You've had this company, the group, you know, you started this 30 years ago. And how did you start thinking about the climate issue and decarbonizing the world? When did this really become your core mission? We have been a big owner in a Norwegian company called Wow, is listed in Oslo. And one of the daughter companies is called Scanship. And Scanship is the biggest supplier of water treatment, sewage, in particular on board cruise ships. So we have been heavily, we was the biggest owner in Scanship from 2008 until 2017. So we have been on the env environmental side all the time. In 2020, we decided that fuel cells is our future. Then we went full speed and here we are. So are you going to make these engines for different types of vehicles? and transportation units, or are you going to stick in the maritime industry? We will stick in the maritime industry for a fuel cell system. Yeah. But we can be a sub-supplier to many other modules, for example, the high truck, because we also have a much higher potential stack production than module production. So we basically, we have two streams there. 
we have the modules where we are making everything. And that is very simple because this is 400 kilowatt. So if you want one module of 400, or if you want 10 modules and you have four megawatt, or if you want 100 modules and you have 40 megawatt, this is just stacking. So you have to make this as simple as possible to get economy of scale. Yeah. And they don't have much time because basically regulations, we hope, are going to force the hand of a lot of the industry to clean up their act. For right. sure, they have to do something. And is the states, I mean, I know that Europe is really ahead of us on a lot of the climate policy. Are you optimistic that in the United States we're going to push a little bit further now in the green world? Or how do you see it? I think that the administration you have now is doing a fantastic job. And they really want to move forward and be in the front line again where they should be. I think they are on the right way. Interesting. So all the major oil companies today is extremely active in the change. Right. You mentioned Shell as well. Shell, BP, Saudi Aramco, all of them. Equinor, everybody. They're all investing in the future because they know it's going to shift. Yeah, so because it's smart. going to be a transition. And of course, they will. all the big guys will still be big guys. They are just moving from black to green gold. What gets you excited about this hydrogen space? Personally, how do you see this impact that you can help make on the world? We at least we do everything we can and we are do the best as we can. And I hope that in 20 years from now, I can sit with my grandchildren and see that we was a part of it from the beginning. I'm so excited about this whole thing and I'm so excited for your company. What advice do you have for other entrepreneurs in this climate or impact space? I think everybody has to do a little bit. Everybody, everybody do a little thing that is going to help a lot. Yeah. It's not so difficult. So, and what are the you know next big steps right in front of you at Tico? The next big steps for us, except that we think we are doing big steps every day, but of course we have the launch of the high truck next summer. We have a launch of the hydrogen container to the construction site in the third quarter. And in between that, we're going to do a lot of sales and release the contracts to the market so they know that we are moving on in the right way. I'm really happy to see it. And uh, a lot of people are looking at this maritime space, but you're you're in it and you're making things happen. So that's that's pretty exciting. I was so happy to connect with Tori, who is absolutely everywhere right now promoting his fuel cell stack technology. This maritime stack appears to be the first of its kind and could have a huge impact on the whole industry and the ocean. I also enjoyed the broader discussion about the future of green hydrogen. Maybe I'll hold off on getting that Tesla for a few more years. I might end up driving a green hydrogen Toyota. Another thing that struck me was how Tori sees his legacy. Like many of our mission-driven entrepreneurs, he wants his legacy to be for his grandchildren to know that he was part of the solution. Thank you for tuning in. Please follow Happy Planet wherever you listen and leave us a rating and review. It really does help new listeners discover the show. Happy Planet was reported and hosted by me. I am also the executive producer. The talented Dylan Hoyer is our producer and editor. Composer George Brandel Agloff created the theme music. Learn more about my work and get in touch by visiting happyplanetpodcast.com.